Let me ask the all important question. Uh, do you know how much Atlas can curl? <laughs> Have you? <laughs> I mean, you know, this for us humans, that's really one of the most fundamental questions you can ask another human being. Curl, <laughs> bench. It probably so can't curl as much as we can yet. But uh, a metric that I think is interesting yeah. is, um, you know, another way of, of looking at that strength is, you know, the box jump. So if how high of a box can you jump onto? Question. And uh, Atlas... I don't know the exact height. It was probably a meter high or something like that. It was a pretty pretty tall jump that Atlas was able to manage uh, when we last tried to do this. And and I have video of uh, my chief technical officer doing the same jump. And he really struggled, you know. To oh, get the up, human. But the human, getting all the way on top of this box. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, Atlas was able to do it. Um, we're now thinking about the next generation of Atlas. And we're probably going to be in the realm of a person can't do it, you know, with this, with the next generation. You know, the, the robots, the actuators are going to get stronger, where it really is the case that at least some of these joints, some of these motions will be stronger. And to understand how high it can jump, you probably had to do quite a bit of testing. Oh, yeah. And there's lots of videos of it trying and failing. And that's, you know, that's all, you know. We don't always release those those videos, but they're a lot of fun to look at. <laughs> uh, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but if can you talk to the jumping? Because you talked about the walking, and it took a long time, many, many years to get the walking to be natural. But there's also really natural looking, uh, robust, resilient jumping. How hard is it to do the jumping? Well, again, this stuff has really evolved rapidly in the last few years. I, you know, the first time we did a somersault, um, you know, there was a lot of kind of manual iteration. What is the trajectory? You know, how hard do you throw you? In fact, the, at, in these early days, uh, I actually would, when I'd see early experiments that the team was doing, I might make suggestions about how to change the technique. Again, kind of borrowing from my own intuition about how backflips work. Um, but frankly, they don't need that anymore. So in, in the early days, you had to iterate kind of in almost a manual way, trying to change these trajectories of the arms or the legs mm -hmm. uh, to try to get the th you know a, a successful backflip to happen. Um, but more recently, we're running these model predictive uh, uh, control techniques where we're able to, the robot essentially can think in advance for the next second or two about how its motion is going to transpire. Mm -hmm. And you can, you know, solve for optimal trajectories to get from A to B. So this is happening in a much more natural way. And, and we're really seeing an acceleration happen in the development of these behaviors, again, partly due to these um, optimization techniques, uh, sometimes learning techniques. Um, it, so it's, there's, it's hard in that there's a lot of mathematics and uh, behind it. Uh, but we're figuring that out. So you can do model predictive control for, uh, I mean, I don't even understand what that looks like when the entire robot is in the air, flying and doing a back. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> but 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 that's the cool part, right? So, you know, you, yeah. you know the physics, we, we can calculate physics pretty well using, you know, Newton's laws about how it's going to evolve over time. And the road, you know, this, this, the sick trick, which was a front somersault with a half twist, is yeah. a good example, right? You saw the robot on various versions of that trick, I've seen it, land in different configurations, and it still manages to stabilize itself. And so, you know, what this model predictive control means is, again, the, in real time, the robot is projecting ahead, you know, a second into the future and sort of exploring options. And if I if I move my arm a little bit more this way, how is that gonna affect the outcome? And so it can do these calculations, many of them, you know, uh, and, and basically solve where, you know, given where I am now, maybe I took off a little bit screwy from how I had planned, I can adjust. So you're adjusting in the air? Adjust the on the fly. So the, the model predictive control lets you adjust on the fly. And of course, I think this is what, you know, People adapt as well. We we when when we do it, even a gymnastics trick, we try to set it up so it's as close to the same every time. But we figured out how to do some adjustment on the fly, and now we're starting to figure out that the robots can do this adjustment on the fly as well using these techniques in the air. That's so 
I mean, it just feels, from a robotics perspective, just surreal. Well, that's sort of the, uh, you talked about underactuated, right? Yeah, so when you're, really... when, when you're in the air, there's some, thing, there's some things you can't change, right? You yeah. can't change the momentum while it's in the air because you can't apply an external force or torque. And so the momentum isn't going to change. So how do you work within the constraint of that fixed momentum to still get from A to B <laughs> where, where you want to be? That's really underactuated. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the air. I mean, you bec you become a drone for a brief moment in time. No, you're not even a drone because you can't <laughs> can't hover. You can't hover. You can't. You're gonna you're gonna impact soon. Be ready. <laughs> yeah. Have you considered uh, like a hover type thing? Or no, no, no. it's too much weight. No. <laughs> I mean, it's just it's just incredible. I, uh, and just even to have the guts to try backflip with such a large body, that's wild. <laughs> What, like, uh, how... no, we definitely broke a few robots trying, that. <laughs> <laughs> but that, but that's where the build it, break it, fix it, you know, uh, strategy comes in. You gotta be willing to break. And what ends up happening is you end up by breaking the robot repeatedly, you find the weak points and then you end up redesigning it. So it doesn't break so easily next yeah. time, you know, <laughs> through the breaking process, you learn a lot, like a lot of lessons and you keep improving, not just how to make the backflip work, but everything yeah. just and how to build the machine better. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is there something about just the guts to come up with an idea of saying, you know what, let's try to make it do a backflip? Well, I think the courage to do a backflip in the first place and, and to not worry too much about the ridicule of somebody saying, why the heck are you doing backflips with robots? Sure. Because a lot of people have asked that, you know, why, <laughs> why, why are you doing this? Why stuff? go to the moon <laughs> in this decade and do the other things, JFK? <laughs> Not because it's easy, because it's hard. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask questions.